Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Chuck's webinar on neuroblastoma. And thank you again for joining us today. My name is Audrey Ludic, and I'm the Program Development Manager for Chuck Childhood Cancer Foundation in South Africa. Chuck is a nonprofit a childhood cancer organization, and we support children and teens with cancer or life-threatening blood disorders in South Africa, and we also support their families. Chuck offers comprehensive child and family support through psychosocial, emotional, and practical support as we support the pediatric oncology units in South Africa. We have, for example, 11 CHOC accommodation facilities close to the pediatric oncology units in South Africa, and we offer around 27,000 bed nights per annum to our patients on treatment and on an outpatient basis. We also offer transport assistance to ensure that no child stops treatment because they don't have funds to come to, to the hospitals or the specialized um, treatment centers. We try to alleviate the emotional and financial stress um, that is associated with the disease through, our, through many programs. We offer nutritional support to name but a few. Please visit our website to learn more about what CHOP does and um, what we do on our website at www.choc.org.za. In 2018, in September, the World, uh, World Health Organization launched the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer with the goal of reaching at least 60% survival rate by 2030 while reducing suffering. And if we can succeed in this, we will save approximately 1 million additional lives of children with cancer um, in the next decade. As part of CHOC's awareness program, our training and education program are hosting monthly CPD accredited talks on the different childhood cancers and the early warning signs thereof. We believe that early detection saves lives. The webinars are available afterwards on YouTube and we invite you to share it with your colleagues and with the, uh, your healthcare professionals. Again, we want to thank the um, SACCSG and the members who voluntarily give up their time in support of these webinars. The CPD accredited webinars on childhood cancers are to increase disease knowledge of childhood cancer to healthcare professionals. And in doing so, we hope to reduce the mortality and morbidity of children with cancer. Well, today, we are honored to have Dr. Jock van Heerden with us. So Dr. Jock van Heerden is a pediatric oncologist who trained in South Africa, but currently works in Belgium at the Antwerpen University Hospital. His main field of interest is solid tumors and rare tumors, as well as pediatric oncology systems in low and middle income countries. He has research interests in South Africa, East Africa and Belgium and completed his PhD in neuroblastoma in a limited resource setting. With the pediatric oncology department and the Uganda Cancer Institute, he has developed a pediatric oncology fellowship training program. And as an active member of the uh, SACCG, the Belgium Society of Pediatric Hematology Oncology and SILE. He aims to improve the outcomes for children diagnosed with childhood cancer. Please welcome Dr. Jacques van Heerden. As, and Jacques, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise um, on um, neuroblastoma with us. We're really looking forward to your talk. And while um, we give him a chance to, um, to um, manage his own presentation, I just want to say you are most welcome to put um, chats, your, your questions in the chat. And at the end of the talk, if there are any questions, Dr. Jock will um, answer them. Jock, over to you. Thank you, Audrey. It's certainly a pleasure to be here today. And it was really wonderful to put this presentation together because uh, 
you kind of made me think of um, what I've been doing over the past few years. So um, I hope that you guys can all see my screen. And so there we go. So neuroblastoma is really an interesting tumor um, in the lower and middle income countries. It's a very revered tumor because it is such a chameleon of a tumor. And I hope by showing you my presentation today, you will understand why it's such a challenging tumor to manage. So um, just uh, before I start, I'd like to thank Chuck for giving me this opportunity. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see my affiliations as well. So just a small definition of what um, neuroblastoma is. It's a neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, that comes from a neural crest origin. That means that it's all the cells that start from the brain down the paraspinal nerve tissue, as you can see in the little um, picture, and it goes all the way to the adrenal gland and all the way then down to the pelvis. And um, it's also very metabolically active, which means it secretes a lot of hormones that influence how um, we, um, um, how the children present, they present in a very toxic fashion, like that look very, very sick. So the, uh, um, the question was always asked, so um, even in higher income countries, um, neuroblastoma has a bad prognosis and um, it's very difficult to quantify this for people. So is it a percentage? Um, is it what medical staff think, that, um, if it's a bad prognosis or so forth? I mean, you can decide for yourself if you think a tumor is doing really well, um, how, much, or how, many, or how much must the percentage be for it to be a good or a bad um, prognostic tumor? So this is a very famous little picture that we have. Um, it's um, used all over the world. So from the 1940s, you can see all the different tumors, how the survival progressed up until the years 2000. And you can see that um, um, with some of the bone tumors, if you follow the little blue dark, the dark blue line, it was one of the tumors that took really long to get to a certain point um, to be, uh, to be uh, curable. And it's still not even reaching that 70%. Um, here is a picture from the Belgian Cancer of uh, Registry, just to show you in higher income countries um, how from the years 2000 onwards, um, it's, it's actually been doing quite well with an overall uh, picture of um, a 90 percent survival, but that is with the good and the bad type of neuroblastoma combined. I'll, I'll get to that just now, what is good and bad. Um, so the reality in lower middle income countries is when we look at this picture, um, if we take Belgium as a higher income country, the data that we have from South Africa is that Overall, that we only uh, manage to um, um, save 37.6% of children diagnosed with cancer uh, with neuroblastoma. Uh, and this comes from the, the study that we did, did in South Africa. Now, next to it, you can see, appreciate that there are different risk groups um, when it comes to neuroblastoma, which I will explain in a second. And in South Africa, we have a predominance of high risk and they only reach a, a survival of 27.6% over five years, um, which is a significantly um, low number in, in the context of um, cancers, uh, childhood cancers. So let's look at specifically at neuroblastoma and how it all fits together. So neuroblastoma is a solid tumor and what that means for an oncologist is that at some stage, this tumor must um, be resected surgically uh, and or also have some uh, radiation for it to be curable. And these are known as local therapies. Then the other aspect is that um, neuroblastoma has a very diverse um, clinical and pathological picture, which I'm gonna to illustrate to you now, 
just to show to you how complex it is to really understand to what degree neuroblastoma needs to be treated. So if we just look at the clinical presentation, this is but um, six pictures of the clinical presentation of um, neuroblastoma. You can see it can be a slight um, clinical presentation of an eye, as you can see in the middle picture, that is mildly closed, which is called Horner's syndrome, or it could be um, skin lesions, as you can see on the baby at the bottom, it can be a distended abdomen, as you can see of the baby completely on the right-hand side, um, or it could be a mass that is uh, close by to the spine with some kind of neurological fallout without any external um, clinical um, signs for you to follow. So, oops, the clinical presentation. So the first, so first, what we know and what, that you saw from those pictures is that the age plays an extremely important um, um, a role in how uh, these children present. So children under the age of 12 months, they do much better. And they are the kind of patients that present with a small mass that might disappear without anybody knowing, or only some skin lesions or just enlarged liver. Whereas children that are between the age of two and five have an intermediate uh, picture and uh, they present with um, multiple pictures of, of, um, of presentations that might mimic other diseases like tuberculosis, infections, neurological diseases, gastrointestinal diseases that you can't put your finger on that directly to know that this is a kind of cancer. And then you also have the children older than 10 years and adults where it's a very slow growing cancer, very resistant to treatment, and they really have the worst kind of prognosis. So when we step over to the pathology or what the tumor itself looks like, um, we also notice that there are different kinds of cells, whether they are very immature cells and grow fast or mature cells and grow slowly, and that influences how fast the tumor grows and how aggressive this tumor is. So if it's a mature kind of tumor, it grows slowly and can be resected only with surgery if it hasn't advanced too far. Or you have this really fast um, growing tumor with um, immature cells um, that spreads really fast and metastasize, which makes it very difficult to treat and is nearly almost fatal. So if we just look at this from a prognostic point of view, so what I've done is given you some smiley faces just to indicate through my whole um, talk what is good or what is bad. So the smiley face is obviously good. So when you have good differentiated cells or very mature cells, that is very good because you can just remove them. They're slow growing. But if it's undifferentiated or immature cells, they grow really fast with a bad prognosis. When we look at the stage or the spread of, uh, of the tumor, um, we have two classification systems. One is um, if you can do surgery up front, and that is the staging system. As you can see, if it's still localized, the picture very much on your left-hand side, in one place, it's stage one. With greater spread, it increases. So stage three is local in the abdomen or a specific region or the neck or so forth where it's limited to that one cavity, that's a stage three. Stage four is where it spreads much further to either the liver, to the lymph nodes um, outside of the uh, specific compartment or to the lungs or the bone marrow. And then there's this very special kind of staging, it's called stage 4S, which is in children under the age of 12 months. And it is spread to, it's a, a local primary that is spread to the liver and the bone marrow and the skin. But funnily enough, this is a really good prognostic 
um, um, presentation and these children are very easily cured. So as you can see, a very odd um, staging for, um, where this is a spread, a metastatic spread um, a presentation, but can is curable. Now, if you can't do surgery up front, there is a staging um, that uh, um, is from a clinical presentation in the beginning, and as you can see at the bottom, it's L1, L2, M, and MS. So that is about um, if you have image-defined risk factors, which I will explain to you, where we use a radiology to stage uh, a patient uh, and then to see um, what the prognostic and treatment um, applications are. Now, just to overlap the two, so stage one to three is usually L1 and L2, where M for metastatic is universally also stage four, and MS is um, um, congruent with stage 4S. So what are the differences here? Is that the most important thing is that between stage one, two, and three, or L1 and L2, they are mostly still resurgically resectable, which if you remember, resecting a tumor, a solid tumor is good. And um, stage four or M metastatic where you can't remove all the metastasis surgically is bad. So if you look at the line at the bottom, so from the lowest um, staging to the highest, that becomes a, a, a worse prognosis. So now you've heard me say a lot about prognostic factors. Now, what are prognostic factors? Those are either patient-related um, characteristics or characteristics that we know from the tumor that can be grouped together to say how likely the child is to um, be cured and to what degree do we need to treat the child to see it, to get a cure rate. So I've already spoken about age and stage. Now, and the, the site of the primary tumor um, differs also a little bit. Oops, sorry. Um, so for instance, uh, a patient that has a, a tumor in, um, for instance, the uh, uh, next to the spine does much better than if it's in the adrenal gland. And then, the other is a tumor histology, as we've spoken about the kind of cells that it presents with. Now, age is very, so why I want to show you this graph is how the age presentation between countries differ. Um, so if you look at the very light blue graph, that is in Belgium, like a higher income country, we see that many more children present at a younger age. And if you remember what I've just said, younger children do better, so they are more easily treated. So when we look at the graph in South Africa, the, the dark blue graph, most of our children present after the age of two years, which make, uh, makes, uh, make them much more difficult to treat and have treatments available for them. So you can already see that in a country like South Africa, we are sitting with a population that is already more difficult to treat based on one characteristic. So why is this important? So as I said, that um, when we treat and they at a higher risk, so higher age groups go to higher, and if they have more um, high risk or prognostically bad features, we have to treat more to get them um, there. So if we look at this graph in the 1960s, there they basically only had surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy to treat the patient. And that got us a, a cure rate of about 20%. As it progressed, they, they found out that giving an autologous transplant thus, that means completely wiping out the bone marrow of a child with a really high dose of chemotherapy and giving back their own bone marrow to grow again, and then giving a, a drug called cisretinoic acid. That has shown us that by the late 2000s, that that increased the prognosis to about 40%, and especially for children with a very high risk um, neuroblastoma. Why is this important? 
because currently in South Africa, we can't, um, we can't offer autologous transplants to our patients who are in this state um, setting or the government hospitals. And um, cis-retinoic acid isn't um, readily available for use. So you can see in South Africa, just with our three first modalities, we can, in high risk in neuroblastoma, hope for at least 20%. And we have to, uh, uh, so just getting to that, we have to do all three of those modalities. If you drop one of those three modalities, it becomes less than 20%. So we've already spoken so if you remember, I said that well-differentiated cells are better. So cis-retinoic acid is a drug that forces immature cells to go to more mature cells and the, with a better prognosis. And now you can also understand why that has helped with the survival in conjunction with autologous transplants. So if we go back to our little graph of the 1940s to the years 2000, Having done all of this, we could see that the low risk and intermediate risk, so all the good um, characteristics, children had survival close to 100%, 90 and uh, um, higher, but we still struggled with our high risk patients that only, only got to 40%. Uh, just remember these graphs are based on higher income countries. So, if we look at neuroblastoma, it's not just one disease, if you want to put it like this. It's a spectrum of disease. And as I've explained to you now, so if you're born with it as a baby or at a very young age, you can see that it's kind of a good prognosis. Can you see the smiley face, happy, happy, if it's a younger child? Then as the risk goes up, it's very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk and high risk, the face turns very sour and sad. As you can see, uh, as I've explained to you with those risks, it becomes really bad. But once again, I warned you, neuroblastoma is a very chameleon-like um, tumor. So, with our, uh, so with our, uh, um, in our higher risk group, we also know that depending on the genetics, that in, inside of the higher risk group, there's also a variation of how well a, uh, a tumor can be treated or not treated. When we look at, for instance, our very low risk and perinatal, where we think, oh, it's easy, they get 100% survival rate. Aha, there is a subgroup where the liver expands really fast. And those children present really uh, in in a, a kind of emergent state that if they're not treated really fast, that they can, that 90% of those children with rapidly increasing tumors can die. And this was proved by two independent European studies um, that if this case, uh, if this is the case, that those children that we knew uh, would think do really well um, could also have a bad prognosis. So other things is, the kind of, I've already mentioned that the kind of treatment and the completeness of that treatment is also a prognostic factor. So if we look at low risk tumors, which you can just cut out and all of it is there, happy face. That's all that needs to happen and you follow those patients up. Intermediate risk patients need a little bit of chemotherapy once that tumor is contained and you can cut it all out, happy face, they're cured. If there's a little bit left over, you give radiotherapy, happy face, they're cured. Now you can understand why low risk and intermediate risk patients can reach cure rates of up to 90 to 100%. So based on all of this, with all of these um, um, so, um, characteristics, I just want to quickly show you how we decide how they are treated and how that fits in. So some of the earliest um, stratification systems were based on surgery. So you can see on the one side, if you take stage and age and some of the genetics and you see how much of the tumor was resected, it gives you a combined classification, either low, intermediate or high risk. And according to that, you can decide 
if there's more chemotherapy needed, do you need to give radiotherapy? What is the surgical uh, management further? Do they need a transplant and so forth? This was mainly done by the Northern, uh, North American groups. So just going back to high-risk neuroblastoma, uh, because we haven't mentioned that uh, very much. So how does this work? As you can see on the left-hand side, there's all those cl risk classifications uh, or factors. And what's really important the way, what, that I'm introducing now is LDH and ferritin, which are two markers. The one is an inflammatory marker, um, and the other one is um, kind of a, a cell um, a reminiscent marker that also has a good, that can easily be tested in the blood. That's really nice for lower and middle income countries because it's cheap. Um, and that then um, determines your risk. So in high risk um, neuroblastoma, most of these are bad. Um, and so what we need to do for a neuroblastoma that are high risk, they have a very extended treatment period. So they need more than chemotherapy, surgery, and radiotherapy. So the treatment is divided into three groups or three stages. You have induction, consolidation and maintenance. So induction is where we give a lot of chemotherapy to see if we can get the metastatic disease under control or get the main tumor as small as possible. Why is this important? Because then you have to do surgery to cut out what is left and then you can do an autologous transplant and that is that little bone you see with the, with the syringe in it. So that's your bone marrow transplant. And then you can also give radiotherapy. And then after that, you need to give maintenance therapy, which um, I've already mentioned one part for you, that's the cis-retinoic acid. Now you can see, if you look at the percentages, if you only finish the induction and do the surgery and do the radiotherapy, you get a 20% survival. If you add autologous transplant to that, you can get up to 35, 40%. Then if you add cis retinoic acid, you can get up to 45%. So that is, this is mainly what it looked like until the end of the year 2000s. So the most important thing here is the surgery that needs to happen, as you can see in that one little part. Now, let's get back to those image-defined risk factors. So looking at your radiology characteristics, um, there's a very specific characteristic of, of neuroblastoma. It grows a little bit like cement. So those of you who are avid builders or you like fixing your house, you love neuroblastoma because how neuroblastoma grows, it grows in between everything. So if you think of blood vessels, muscles and organs, it kind of goes around everything. And it also, it, it sticks to all these structures as you can see in those pictures. And especially the last one, it's, it grows in between your blood vessels and everything. And just as a surgeon, this is a nightmare because you can't remove this. I mean, if you have you ever tried to remove cement between other structures, you basically have to peel it off. Very difficult if it's a blood vessel, but if you cut it, the patient starts bleeding. So this is where your image-defined risk factors come in. If this, if you don't see any of these characteristics, which that is a it's a list of about 20 characteristics in different parts of a body where it doesn't grow into an organ or a structure, doesn't cling to it, or doesn't grow around it. That is L1. So it's without an image-defined risk factor. If it does have an image-defined risk factor where it invades, adheres, or it encases a structure, it's an L2. So why is this really important? It comes back to surgery. Remember I told you in solid tumors, you need to be able to do surgery to cure, cure a patient. And if you have those, these kind of CT scans, if we look at the very first picture on your completely on your left-hand side, there's a blood vessel that is completely surrounded by a tumor. Do you really think that you can cut that blood vessel out? The patient will bleed to death. So it limits the amount of surgery that can be done. 
if you look at the other two, that is a tumor that has grown into the liver or into the kidney and surrounding structures. Can you completely remove that tumor? It's a nearly impossibility. So that means that in a lot of cases, surgery cannot be done. One of your three main treatments falls away and your survival becomes less than 20% in high risk patients. Not a very good sign. So I'm gonna make a very frown face because you can't do surgery. So that is why the medical approaches um, is most often the first one that we start off with because this uh, in high risk um, neuroblastoma, which is about 70% of the cases in South Africa, presents uh, that you can't do surgery up front. And that is why this staging system with your image defined risk factors is quite optimal. Now, what you can uh, appreciate is that we can do most of these in South Africa, but if you look at the end, there are two things, the end mix station uh, status and the 11Q aberrations. We in South Africa don't have the ability to do all these genetic tests. So this limits us in fully classifying our uh, patients' risk stratification like in higher income country. So, I mean, it's a bit difficult to follow a higher income country's protocol to treat a patient if you can't really discern what their risk is at that stage. So, uh, we all know that the pediatric oncology fraternity and everybody that works in it always finds solutions. Um, so, a lot of the uh, a, a lot of pediatric oncologists came together and said, like. Look, let's look at things that are in lower and middle income countries and let's devise a way of stratifying it that way. So they came up with an adapted approach. And if you look at this, number one, you know, is if you do surgery and um, you have a certain amount of um, uh, degree of resection, is your patient, if you look at the bottom, is there symptoms? Is this patient presenting with a liver that's already enlarged? or obstructing a, a, um, a, a, an organ, looking at age, then LDH and ferritin that I've already told you about, that is very easily to, uh, to, to determine in lower middle income countries. And then NMIC, also then focusing on if you have uh, that available to yourself or not. In South Africa, we do. Then you can have a risk classification, which you can see in the middle. It's still not optimal because Obviously, this is a surgical um, um, upfront um, classification, so it limits us a little bit, but already better than the other two where we, the, uh, a lot of it we can't determine. So what did they do? So in 2021, they came up with a revised classification and tried to bring in as much as possible um, for uh, uh, countries that have limitations and this is um, currently where we are at with these classifications that is still mostly um, um, applicable to higher income countries. But why did I put this in here is that you can see what the classification, what the outcomes are uh, for these um, levels. Um, and the higher income countries really get good outcomes. But this is with um, countries that can do autologous transplants and um, have other um, um, treatments. So just to run by it, if we look at the most important things, number one, in your high-risk neuroblastoma. So if you've done your induction based on the tumor, if you have those image-defined risk factors, and if the tumor has spread really far, you give chemotherapy. That's the little purple bottle with that funny star thing in it. Can you do your surgery? No, if you can't, you give more chemotherapy. Can you do your surgery now after you finish with the chemotherapy? Yes, you can do surgery. Yay, smiley face. Can you go and do um, your autologous transplant and your radiotherapy? Even better if it can. So then you can reach up to 40, 45% cure rate. If you can't, bad. Because if you can't do surgery, one of your three main modalities um, is decreased or not available, 
that's less than 20% survival. So this is a more accurate graph than just stating one percentage. So we can see again, like in South Africa, or this is a higher income um, setting, at the end of the year 2000, there was at least 35% difference in what we did with, got with high risk neuroblastoma versus the rest. So we had to find a few solutions to that. So what did they do? They started doing a lot of genetic testing. So um, and what, with next generation sequencing and epigenetic testing, they started um, identifying a lot of genetic um, um, markers and mutations that could be targeted um, beyond NMIC, like the ALK gene mutation and PBOX2 um, mutations, and started developing drugs aimed at those. Um, if, the, if these markers were present, they were seen as more um, adverse than just normal um, high-risk neuroblastoma that do not have these um, uh, markers. And um, so they are less likely to be cured or if um, they are less likely to resolve so that your image-defined risk factors are decreased for surgery. So if we look at this, so for those, uh, so they went even further to look at what happens on the, uh, on a very molecular level in a tumor. There are many different uh, processes that happen. So one of the things that they saw is that by trying to stop the proliferation, the movement of um, little um, of, uh, of um, tumor cells, um, limiting their migration, that they don't make new blood vessels, that they can't stick to things, that they can't grow into things. Um, by limiting that, you can get a better survival. And that is one of the functions of your disiloganglioside. So they made a drug called anti-GD2, which we now all know um, um, is a very important immune therapy in neuroblastoma, but has been a game changer since year 2000. Furthermore, um, what we're doing um, is looking at all these other targets. Now, if you look at this picture, it looks worse than my house after the cats has rummaged through it. So every single one of these markers can be targeted for a, for a drug, but you can just see this is millions and millions. And these are drugs that are, these are targets that are in development, but are not available to lower and middle income countries and are also very expensive. So the most, uh, the most targetable one um, at the moment is still the ALK um, mutation um, because there are immune therapies that can be aimed at that. Sadly, they are also not readily available in um, South Africa. So just looking at these two, um, uh, when we look at these, these have changed the, the, the game so that in higher income countries, they now reach 60 to 70% survival for higher, you know, for, neuro, for high risk neuroblastoma. That is, very, that is really sad if you think that in lower and middle income countries, we're still trying to breach that 20%. That's a gap of 50% between higher and lower income countries. Then we can treat in lower income countries and higher income countries, but we still know that about 50% of patients will relapse. Um, and only, and when they relapse, even in higher income countries, only 20 to 30% of these children can be saved. That is why looking at these targets are really important because the function of getting those targets is to make sure that patients don't relapse. So, um, so when we look back at this picture, so at the end here, you can see by um, adding the targeted therapies, the survival has, has increased. But still in lower income countries here where we stop because we can't get surgeries, we're still stuck at the 20%. Poor treatment responses, not much to be done. Okay, so is it worthwhile this immunotherapy to chase after it? Yes, it is because we've seen in there's two independent uh, independent um, studies that have shown 
that in higher income countries, instead of 50% of children relapsing, 30% of children only relapse. Now that's a difference of 20% and a big improvement. I want you to bear this in mind because I'm gonna come back to this in a, a little bit later. So once again, we have this spectrum over here that, that I would like to remind you. So putting it all together, we need to look at three big aspects when we treat our neuroblastoma patients, regardless of where they are in the world. So first of all, you have your clinical presentation, as you can see on the left-hand side. In lower middle income countries, a big aspect is the resources we have, which I've already shown if we don't have surgery available, radiotherapy, transplant, and so forth, but also the behavior of a patient and their families. Do they go to doctors? Do they notice these tumors and everything before, um, before it's too late, before it spreads too far? And obviously tumor characteristics, because we can't just say that people wait too long. Um, and that is why they have quite advanced tumors. We also have to acknowledge that neuroblastoma is a very aggressive tumor that can spread fast even before you've noticed it. And then the other aspect in the bottom is your genetics and your uh, other markers. And then in the other corner is how much treatment we can get. And the only balance that we need to get here is how much we can give and where in that treatment we can actually aim to. So uh, bearing this in mind, so when we look at the first part in the, in the management, there is still a lot that we can do. So the World Health Organization, as Audrey has mentioned in her opening, has this big project going to get these resources to a lot of lower income countries by supporting governments and initiating projects to build up the capacities of um, um, of um, oncology units in these countries to get the treatment modalities to be able to treat um, cancers. Unfortunately, neuroblastoma is not one of the six um, tumors that is uh, targeted by the World Health Organization, but all the efforts they are do are making to get these resources to, to countries will aid the development of neuro, uh, neuroblastoma services like surgery, like radiotherapy, which you can see is one of the first, is the, one of the three major treatment modalities that's uh, absolutely vital for neuroblastoma. Then changing behavior, which um, um, Chuck has also set a very nice precedent with their Sensulian program and getting people to know what are the warning signs of cancer. Um, I've just recently been involved in a study in Uganda where we saw that by identifying a child with an abdominal mass with high blood pressure and fever, you, they can identify up to 90% of their neuroblastomas. That's three signs that can be done in a clinic. So, um, that just shows you how important something like the Sensulian is. It doesn't take radio, uh, radiology um, um, diagnosis to diagnosis. It's the awareness that counts. Then um, understanding the tumor characteristics in your specific region. And for that, I am extremely thankful that um, the South African Children's Cancer Group um, has uh, and the Neuroblastoma Working Group have supported me in my PhD, we have seen what the South African po uh, population of neuroblastoma is. And that has made us focus more on where we need to target um, our um, energies as pediatric oncologists to advance um, the, um, the, the outcomes of our patients. The only, uh, so as I said to you, this is a very chameleon type tumor. The other thing that I want to introduce to you is something called tumor heritogenicity, which means that a tumor is not one single homogenous um, characteristic. As you can see in the picture of a lot of nice little colors, 
it is, it's made up of a lot of different um, cells. And if you look at the tumor cells, you have little red ones, you have little blue ones, and you've got little green ones. So, um, and if you look then at the picture on the right-hand side, some of these cells are sensitive to chemotherapy, others are not. So you might kill some of them with your treatments, but other ones not. And those might keep on growing and spreading. So that is why we need to understand specifically what is happening in the tumors in your own region to understand how you should apply different um, drugs and then especially the, the newer drugs that are targeting specific um, genetics to understand what is worthwhile in your country to pursue um, and so that you can spend your money wisely. When, so when we go, so I've already said lower, low risk and intermediate risk. We know already what to do. Identify, cut out, give chemotherapy, radiotherapy, we can get to 90, 100%. High risk um, 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 neuroblastoma is obviously more difficult. And what I want to show to you is, if you look at the red, red arrow, so higher income countries has focused on adding more and more treatments on consolidation and maintenance. And what ha as I have explained to you already, lower and middle income countries, we can't even get past the induction phase where the yellow um, 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 arrow is and um, because we can't even get to surgery. So our focus should be at the induction phase because at this stage, we get about 32% of patients into remission in South Africa to be able to get to surgery, which is very low if you think about it. So we, we can't focus on our autologous transplants and our maintenance therapies if we can't even get to surgery. So, sorry. So when we look at induction, we had to go and look what kind of induction should we use because there's various different kinds of induction. So if you look at the two studies below, one was done in South Africa, one was done in Europe. We compared uh, apples and apples and pears and pears. And what did we come out with is that the toxicity differs in, um, in, in the regimens, but in South Africa, the three that we looked at, which was Kojic, rapid Kojic and uh, uh, an, uh, an induction with doxorubicin, they were all equal, but rapid Kojic, because of its intensity, was more toxic with more diffs. Um, and then in the Europe, so that is why we chose Kojic as our, um, as our um, um, induction chemotherapy and not one with doxorubicin, because the one with doxorubicin did not have a significantly better outcome or um, re uh, remission rate than the other. And, and in Europe, they came to exactly the same conclusion. So that is why they kept on with their rapid Kojic, which is their first line. So in South Africa, the problem that we have is, and I hope that we will be publishing this soon, is that because we can't get patients into the metastatic complete remission, surgeons are very reluctant to operate them. So we should be focusing on getting our patients into remission in induction. And so we need to look at, in our country, what is the genetics that we need to target to heap up the treatment up front to get them into remission and not heap, heap up our treatment at the end after surgery when if that even when so because it's hopeless if we can't even get them to surgery so another for, uh, part of induction is extended induction or bridging chemotherapy so those of you know that if you can't get your patient into remission in induction after your standard induction chemotherapy, we give a bridging or an intermediate of our extended induction of topotecan, vincristine, and doxorubicin, which is called TVD. So this, um, uh, in the part, uh, just in June 2022, two articles came out 
to prove that TBD helps get more patients into remission, but it does not improve the overall outcome or the event-free survival of patients in higher income country, but causes more toxicity. So the higher income countries are now advising not to give TVD in the higher income century, uh, um, setting because they have many more other um, treatments to give. Is it still that you're going to say, oh my goodness, South Africa has an extended deduction with TVD in its protocol. Are we supposed to stop doing that in South Africa? No, not at all. And why am I saying that? We can't even get our patients into sur for, for surgery. We don't get our patients to transplant. So we need to play the long game where we give them continuous chemotherapy to extend their life, to make sure that they live longer. Um, and this is where TBD is important. So we can still try and get them into remission for surgery or give them um, chemotherapy to, to, to increase their survival time. So um, in that setting, it is um, still important. So looking at this picture, um, this is, so if we look at um, higher income countries, um, and as you can see, I chose the USA as our higher income country. So they want to do things fast. They play the rapid game. So it's like a hundred meter sprinter. They want to get in fast, high um, kind of chemotherapy to get them to surgery, to get them to transplant, to get them to their immune therapies. In lower income and middle income countries, as you can see our Ethiopian and Kenyan runners, can you see what I did? Higher income country, lower income country um, um, athletics. So we need to do, play the long game. So we need to see how long we can keep our patients alive. And that is why um, 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 my next slide will make much more sense. So a reason, so we need to also give them a kind of maintenance that we can give them um, in a low middle income country where we don't have targeted therapies or immune therapy. So uh, a study that was done in Uganda and presented at South Africa this year by giving CADO, which is um, in palliative dosages um, in nine cycles. So if you know, uh, we, we know that nine cycles, that's every three, month, uh, three weeks. So that is about 10 months of survival or of, of chemotherapy that you're giving. Um, presented these patients with a nearly two year longer survival um, if you give CADO in maintenance after you've given your induction chemotherapy versus patients that did not get a maintenance with CADO. So with the low toxicity of this, it makes absolute sense to keep on giving your patient this low dose chemotherapy because from start to finish, you can get a median survival of 38.5 months. That's, that is just over three years in a high risk um, patient. Not bad for patients that, um, that would die without any treatment at all. I must add that the overall survival does not improve. So they will still all die eventually. So the biggest challenges that we do have in South Africa is getting our patients operated by, um, because we can't get them in metastatic complete remission. In South Africa, about 32% of all high risk um, neuroblastomas do obtain um, um, metastatic complete remission, but only about half of them, half of those 32% are operated in South Africa which I find a bit sad. Um, and we have done a study, which I'm hoping to, uh, it's at the reviewers at the moment. We have proven in South Africa that those patients that have obtained metastatic complete remission and that was operated had an overall survival of nearly 50%. And if you think about it, we only get all of our high risk um, um, patients only get a 20% survival. So. If we can get them operated, we can push it up much higher versus patients that do also get metastatic complete remission, 
but are not operated, they only get a 36.4%. Now you're going to say, but why do I worry? So if you think about it, in South Africa, for every 100 children, about 78 of them are high-risk neuroblastoma. Of those 78, only 32% of them we get into metastatic remission. That's tw about 21 patients. And of those 21 patients, only about a half of them are operated. That's 10 children. So out of 100 diagnoses, only 10 children get to that golden gate where they can get all three of those um, treatments, which I think is quite a low percentage in the greater scheme of things. So when we look at the management, the whole world is now starting to think a little bit differently. I mean, um, I, we have advocated for more treatment in induction um, for a very long time already. And um, recently, and as you can see, published in April 2022, and um, the other one was um, just uh, published um, this month, um, the international community is starting to rethink how we use um, our drugs that we have at the moment. The main change comes from the two, um, from actually a parent, and this is, this is why it's so really important for parents to be involved in the treatment of um, our patients. So Mr. Nicholas Bird is a, a parent that advocates he, he, well, his child passed away in the UK uh, from neuroblastoma and his son uh, received um, an autologous transplant and for the family, just the counselling and the process of going through autologous transplant was so traumatic that he is now advocating against autologous transplants because of its toxicity, the late effects and the quality of life that is decreased because, uh, in these patients because of autologous transplants and of higher income countries having other targeted therapies that, can, that have lower toxicities and better quality of life profiles. He was advocating, can't we redistribute those across the induction, consolidation and maintenance um, to improve the outcomes of patients? So, um, the Americans, um, as you can see, Susan Cohen, they started rethinking, is this possible? And they went back and they, are, they have looked at studies where patients had received uh, immune therapy in induction and consolidation or had received something like MIBG therapy like the Dutch have always done in induction and in consolidation. And they've seen that these patients do as well as patients that have received um, transplants with less um, 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 toxicity and less late effects. So the whole paradigm is being rethought, which is really good for lower and middle income countries because now there will be more and more studies focusing on induction um, and consolidation um, that is more reachable um, for um, lower and middle income countries who do not have as many resources so that they have more um, uh, to think about and treat their children. So all in all, um, what they are advocating and thinking is that in the longer run is that stuff like immune therapies and targeted therapies might actually replace um, um, autologous transplants in the long run. And if you think about it, it makes sense because if you do an autologous transplant, you're basically decreasing the immunity or the immune function of a patient because you're giving them naive cells and knocking their um, immune system out. So it, some, it also doesn't really make sense to try and, and induce immune um, reliant therapies after autologous transplants. Um, there was a really, really beautiful discussion that was done at SIOP International last year um, um, that, uh, where the discussion was very basically uh, on this, that people wanted to move away uh, from autologous transplants. So 
the future of treatment is looking back at these very molecular um, characteristics of all tumors, and they're all present in neuroblastoma, um, um, to see where we can target um, neuroblastoma to get better outcomes. In our um, neuroblastoma protocol, in the maintenance phase, we have suggested using propanolol um, as a drug, and you're going to go like, but propanolol, that is to treat hypertension. Is it to treat the hypertension of the patient that has um, neuroblastoma? No, no, no. So we know that uh, propanolol has an anti-angiolytic um, effect. So it prevents the growth of new blood vessels in tumors. And as you can see, um, um, in, uh, that's one of those um, of the um, um, hallmarks of cancer right at the bottom, the little red block. So other things that we are looking at, um, for instance, here in Europe is trying to kill off cells or getting cells to kill themselves off much earlier. So if you look right at the left hand side, there's a little um, cross there resisting cell death. Um, so something like called ferroptosis, where if you use iron to basically rust the, the, the cell wall of a tumor cell so that the cell wall has a lot of holes for chemotherapy and other drugs to come in, that has shown a lot of promise. Um, and as you can see, for instance, um, um, take, um, doing the epigenetic reprogramming. So look at your um, uh, methylization of your um, genes and your cells, um, um, destroying that. And also using the immune system more acutely um, to attack your tumor cells. Those are the things that we are looking at now. And we are also seeing that with these studies of these molecular things, using these drugs up front in your induction has a much better outcome than using them later in treatment. Because as soon as you administer any kind of treatment to a neuroblastoma cell, it already starts changing itself. It already starts evading your treatment. So if you come in strong and fast in the beginning, killing it off, you get better outcomes with a lower relapse rate than adding those things at the back, which is the, um, the new paradigm um, that is also probably in the future going to be much more advantageous for lower and middle income countries if we can get to those drugs. So just a little bit in summary, I'm nearly I'm finishing up here, is that, so obviously relapse and refractory is really uh, difficult for, for us. Achieving that metastatic complete remission is an absolute barrier for us in South Africa. Getting our multidisciplinary team engagement, getting to surgery, and then convincing people to do surgery in a patient that has potentially a very low um, um, poten potential for cell or prognosis for survival, getting radiotherapy, getting those drugs, getting patients to um, therapies like transplant um, that is still not uh, still valuable, uh, but in the future probably less valuable. And then understanding what is happening in your region with genetics. Um, um, seeing what we should do with unresectable and residual neuroblastoma um, um, tumors. And then what do we do with advanced disease that compromise um, 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 our organ function? And then getting to do molecular uh, tests and genetics so that we can understand where we fit in as South Africans in all of these new things that is being developed and that we don't get left further and further behind. So just in conclusion, this was that, um, that presentation that I saw of discussion that I spoke to you about. If you look at this, this is where, this is neuroblastoma. So if we look at childhood cancers, in, in the world, there's more or less 2,500 new high-risk neuroblastoma diagnoses per year. When we look at it, in America, about 50% of those patients are diagnosed in America. But what is the sad thing? 
In lower and middle income countries, 75 to 80 percent of childhood cancers, thus proportionately, 75 to 80 percent of those 2,500 um, high risk neuroblastoma diagnoses should be in lower and middle income countries. They are just now diagnosed because children die before they get to hospitals. They're never treated or they're misdiagnosed, which is a bit grim. And that is why um, we are doing in South Africa as much as we can to get as much knowledge out there so that lower middle income countries can also come to the table of the treatment and the advancement of the cure for neuroblastoma. So my last slide is obviously the acknowledgement of all the amazing people that, that not just in neuroblastoma, but in childhood uh, cancer care in South Africa, chock for giving people like me the opportunity to tell you people where should we be focusing, what should be done, and probably planting that seed for somebody to take that up and run with it. Um, all my co-investigators, that there are just too many. Please go and look at the, uh, the articles and see their names. They're phenomenal people that are doing a very tough job with our high-risk neuroblastomas. I also want to thank my hospital here in Belgium that allow me to do work on uh, neuroblastoma, not just in Belgium, but in the rest of the world as well. Um, I have to thank the, the Kinderkankerfonds here in Belgium who has subsidized a lot of the publications that we, as, we have published as the South African Childhood Cancer Group. And then obviously the most important people is the patients and their families that go through all these tribulations and hardships and then still allow us to use their data to make more uh, informed decisions to help future people that are in the same situation. Time for some questions, I think. Audrey, back over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jock. That was absolutely amazing. Um, if we look in the chat, there are um, three questions. The first one, one is, why do children under 12 months have a better outcome? Um, would you like to answer? For yes, me so, so first of all, um, we know that um, the kind of tumor cells um, in those children are the less aggressive ones, so they don't grow as fast. So um, by the time they diagnose, they're also most likely not to have spread. They're still localized. And um, if we look at the tumor genetics, so they don't, they, many of them do not have NMIC. They don't have ELK. So they don't have that really bad genetics. So that pushes them to the lower risk or the intermediate risk. Um, we also know that these children, these cells, have the characteristic to just die off by themselves, um, which is very specific to younger children. Um, um, so that is why they do better and um, why they are more successful and sensitive to our treatments. So those are the, the main reasons why they do better. Thank you, Jean. And then the second question is, um, Dunia just asked, is, is she correct when, she, when you say that immunotherapy can substitute the autologous uh, transplant? So um, I, I've, I've touched on this a little bit. Um, so um, in short, yes, but I'm going to say but. But at this stage, there hasn't been large um, trials or studies that have proven this, uh, there, um, in that one article that I've shown about, should we rethink about this, there has been single institution um, studies that have shown that by using your immune therapies um, up front in your um, induction, in your consolidation, and then as a maintenance, it does, we get comparable outcomes, but you can't you can't just leave out your um, autologous transplant and just skip right over to, um, um, to your immune therapy in your maintenance. It doesn't work that way because, uh, because what immune therapy does is it goes to that minimal residual disease, that little cells that we cannot see, it goes and scavenges it 
and goes and looks for that. The problem is if, um, if you have treated a patient up front of chemotherapy already, some of the cells might already start getting resistant. So waiting for that immune therapy until the end, you might have created new resistant clones that might not be targetable by um, anti-GD2 and may have clones that are resistant to anti-GD2. So that is why be very careful to go out there and saying, at this stage, we can't conclusively say that we can replace autologous transplant, but with more drugs and exactly knowing where we should be using all these new drugs in relation to the absence to um, autologous transplants, maybe in the future we can give a conclusive yes. Thank you, Jacques. And then the last question is, can I use proper pranolol to treat hypertension in newly diagnosed neuroblastoma to have both decrease the BP and to decrease blood vessel um, proliferation? Yes, a very good question. This is very interesting. Um, so we still know that most of the, 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 the causes of hypertension in neuroblastoma is not per se the actual hormones, the catecholamines that are produced, but it's because of your um, ACE, um, your ACE um, uh, um, pathway the, from your kidney and the obstruction of blood vessels and so forth. So that is why we still think that... Um, um, your non-propanolol type um, antihypertensives are much better. Please stay away from your calcium inhibitors because if you have a, a occluded a blood vessel in your kidney, that will not uh, bode well for your patient. Um, we do know that if your hypertension is then resistant to your ACE inhibitors and so forth, your, your second line add-on hypertension is propanolol. Should we be using propanolol up front for the tumor itself? Um, well, there's no conclusion to that. The problem is we need blood vessels in the tumor to transport our chemotherapy to the tumor. So if you use propanolol up front and occlude those blood vessels in the tumor itself, we don't know how much of our chemotherapy actually gets to the middle of the tumor. So it's not indicated at this stage. Um, it is, it's been, um, um, so at this stage, most of the indications is rather for your maintenance or your metronomic therapies after many lines of treatment um, um, where all your co conventional uh, dr um, treatments um, have, have not been good. So once again, use very, very cautiously. And um, so I can't say conclusive yes for now. Um, so, but maybe watch this space. Once the Africans have started looking more and more at this, maybe we can give you a better answer in the future. Wow, Jacques, that was absolutely most informative. The, the comments in the chat is very positive. Thank you so much for an amazing presentation. Um, if you have Martin. any questions, yeah, you're welcome. If you have any questions um, or need to refer a child, please visit CHOC um, website on Refer a Patient. You can also call the CHOC helpline on 0800 -555 during office hours where you can find help. And then on the CHOC um, events page, you will find information about our upcoming webinars. The next webinar will be on the 3rd of August, where Prof. Gita Naidu will talk about leukemia and lymphoma. And then on the 31st of August, we're going to have a very interesting webinar where we will go in conversation with African traditional medicines and African um, traditional healers just to, to hear their side of the story as well. And so thank you again so much for joining us. And please use this knowledge to go and um, save the lives of children. Jacques, again, very grateful to you. It was, a, it was an amazing presentation and lots of luck to you there in Belgium. Please thank keep you. on doing the great work that you do. So from all of us, the CHOP team, the technical team, thank you so much. Lots of blessings and have a wonderful day. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.